All right, here we go. We Uh-oh. have hip hop royalty in the building. Christopher <laughs> Reed, aka Kid from legendary rap group Kid and Play. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you. Drums, please. There we go, right behind you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I've been, I've been, uh, I had to give the drums some dap. Yep. I feel like I know you and the drums, and, and we never met, but nah, it's hey, great man. to be here. Look, just an honor. Just an honor. Such a, a longtime fan. Like, because you guys were out when I was in high school. Right. And if you were a hip hop kid who was into dancing, like, Kid and Play were like the main people you were watching. Were you into dancing? I was. Really? I was. I was a break dancer originally. What? And then, you know, eventually led into other hip hop. Picture that, everybody. Picture Vlad that. Break Picture dancing. DJ Vlad break dancing. <laughs> right. Loves right. it. Oh, yeah. So, as, as a kid that, that loved to dance, I used to watch your own TV raps every day when I came home from school, whenever it was on. Oh, my goodness. You know, originally, right. Fab Five Freddy, when it was only on once oh. a week. And then every Monday through Friday with Ed Lover and Dr. Dre. And you would watch the kid and play videos. You'd have to catch them. There was no on demand. It was appointment. There was no YouTube. Yeah, you had to you had to go out of your way. It was appointment television. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yo MTV raps. Those are the days. And and we, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, I think the the fans kind of craved it because it was so it was so new and it wasn't giving you a whole lot of it. But then eventually they did. Right. right. It became it was it was it became a once a day thing. Right. Yeah, because like originally it was like on the weekends. Yeah, because there were no hip hop stations back then. No, everything was everything was local. Like you know, in New York where I grew up, you know, you had like a video music box. Um, you know, up in the Bay, they had soul beats and stuff. But it right. was but it was local. You had to catch mm-hmm. local. It wasn't a national thing. Was so your MTV Raps was a, a game changer. Yes, know? it was. Yes, it was. I got to interview Fab Five Freddy. That was that was such an honor. Fab is Fab is great. You know, our old friend, um, back in the days was uh, the creator, uh, uh, Ted Demi. And uh, uh, Ted Demi actually directed, he directed Salt and Pepper's Push It video. Right. And he also directed our um, uh, Rolling With Kid and Play. So, ah. I mean, we were, we were really tight with Ted. He was, he was a great guy and he, um, he did a lot for hip hop. You know, he was the guy, had to be that conduit that could show, you know, the white folks in the suits at MTV that this was viable, that this was the next thing. And, mm-hmm. you know, I know he went through a lot to 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 get it done. And then also to believe in in a Ed Lover and Dr. Dre, which, you know, you know, main typically you'd be like, who's gonna put them cats on television? But they were they were perfect. They worked. They worked. They worked. And, Rest, and we peace. all benefited from it, you know, yeah. uh, as as artists. Absolutely. Rest in peace, Ted Demi. Rest in peace, Ted Demi. Died way too young. Way too young. Well, it's your first time here. Yep. I want to start in the very beginning. So you grew up in the Bronx. God said, let there be light. (laughs) No, in the beginning. Yep, Bronx. (laughs) And you had a Jamaican father. That's right. And a white mother. Irish, yeah. Irish. I say I say we Jamaican and Irish. So my family, we got high and drunk. (laughs) (laughs) Jamaican and Irish, come on. (laughs) Is these drums on? Pa-ching! Come on. <laughs> well, in 2020, mixed kids are everywhere oh, you look. Oh, see, but that you're totally right, and I and I love that. And and my kids are are you know kind of mixed, you know, mm-hmm. with a little bit of everything. But uh, yeah, back then we were a little we were a little more rare. Right, because you were born in the 60s. I was born in the 60s. So being mixed in the 60s and 70s in New York, so it wasn't the South. No, nope. but it was still, you know, a fairly racist country. Oh, Back absolutely. Then. <laughs> what was that like? Um, you know, it was it was um it was real interesting. I mean, I wouldn't trade it for anything because I feel like um over time, you know, I got the best of both worlds. But um for my parents at the time, particularly my mother, my white mother, it was tough on her. Um, you know, having a not only just, you know, her parents were like real old school, you know, racist Irish. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. And, you know, much less her dating a black guy. When she came home and told them that she was pregnant by a black dude, you know, they threw her out the house. Like, they disowned her. Wow. They disowned her and never spoke to her again. They never spoke to her again? No. And she, you know, she died when I was nine. She died yeah. in, a, in a car accident when I was, when oh, I was nine. Man. And from the time I was born to the time she passed away, they never spoke to her again. That's how, that's how deep it was. And so she was like, all right, whatever, man, boom, you know, we out. And and then she tried to make it work with my father. And, you know, my father, who just passed away last year, a great dude, 
but he was one of them Jamaican players. So, you know, he was just like, yes, man, we're going to sprinkle my seed over here and over there and over here. And, over. and you know, my, my mom's was one of those cool white chicks. So she was just like, nah, dude, you know what I mean? Like, nah. So it was just, you know, it was me and her, you know, uh, early on. Uh-huh. Uh, and that was good enough. You know, like I said, my mom's was, um, she was the cool white chick. So she always, always had me around. We were in the village a lot, you know, in Greenwich Village. So we were always around people of color. We were always around a gay and straight and, you know, all these different types of people. She was a social worker. So, um, and, you know, when you're a kid, like, you know, I, I didn't know any better, you know, and I'm not going to miss, um, you know, I didn't miss grandparents that I never met, that I never had, that didn't want to have anything to do with so me. You never met them? Um, no, I never met them. I, I, I saw them. They had the nerve to come to the funeral home. The funeral, yeah. Came to the funeral home, and you know what I'm saying. But I was, like I said, I was only nine. I was, I was just too crazy to. Yeah. You know what I'm saying. I, I didn't. I, I was just going through my own, you know, private torture. But what was crazy about them was, um, like I said, they kind of disowned her and whatnot. And um, she went on. Like I said, she was a social worker. So when she passed away, um, her uh, her pension uh, came up for. Uh, you know, the review or whatever, and naturally it was, it was supposed to go to me. Man, they went to court and fought that so that they could get the grandparents. Yeah, came out the wow. came out the woodwork, came and fought, and they got it too. Wow. Expl explain that. Even to me. though they didn't adopt you or anything else, they like didn't that. adopt me. They didn't adopt me. They didn't even say hi to me. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah, they didn't even say. You know what I mean? That's weak. They didn't say nothing. Yeah. So, but but um, I think that made the bond between my mother and I really really strong. Um, but unfortunately, you know, she, she passed very suddenly and, um, you know, that was, you know, that was, that was crazy too. And then I had to go live with, I not had to go, but my, you know, my father, you know, I went to live with my father, mm -hmm. um, who I was just kind of seeing on the weekends. He was like a weekend dad. And, you know, when you go from, you know, Irish white to, you know, hard Jamaican. That was a that was a culture shock. You know what I'm saying? How many kids did he have? Um, he didn't really have a lot of kids. You know what I'm saying? He when I say sprinkling seed, he wasn't having a lot of kids. He was just he was sprinkling some seed. You know what I'm okay. saying? Him jar rum jam session. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I'm, I mean I've got I've got um I got I had two uh, two older brothers. So okay. it was just three of them. So not yeah, a lot, not yeah. A lot. By Jamaican terms, uh, yeah, that that's was nothing. Kind of light. Yeah. I've heard twenty. No, he wasn't. A I've heard thirty. No, he like, wasn't a Jamaican Sean Kemp. No, he wasn't that. <laughs> but he just liked the ladies, and he was, you know, he's very charming and charismatic, and you know, type stuff. So then, I, you know, I went to I went to live uh, with him, him, and that was a, you know, we had some adjusting to do. Well, you have a look that's very interesting because if you didn't grow your hair out. Right. And shaved your head, let's say, you could pass for white. I, could I? <laughs> I think so. You, you, for example, you see guys like Logic, you know, right. like the rapper Logic, Logic who right. I've interviewed, and we yeah. talked about all this. Logic right. is half black as well. Right. But he looks more white. He looks more white. Yeah. With the glasses. And With the glasses yeah. and everything. Right. Great rapper, though. Great rapper. Did you always put yourself in the black community or did white kids think you were white or, or so forth? Because I think like black people in general know a mixed person more than white right. people. So, right. Well, the, uh, like I said, um, what ended up happening, like when I when I went to live with with um, my father, you know, like my whole life kind of changed, and it, my life became way blacker. You know, um, it was me and him, um, and eventually, you know, we ended up in in Queens in a in a very you know great middle class black neighborhood. Um, you know, the only relatives that I interacted with, with people on my dad's side were all, you know, black, black folks, Jamaicans, you know what I mean? Um, so my life kind of went, went, went black. And, and that was cool because particularly at that time, you know, if you're talking about, you know, seventies and stuff like that, you know, white folks were, were weird, even in New York, even as cosmopolitan as a place uh, as New York is. Um, white folks was a, a lot of times where we were living. At some, at some point, we were living in Staten Island and other areas we lived in. The white folks was like, if you was any part black, we're not fucking with you. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like we, you're, you're, you know, what I'm saying, you know, you're a nigger. You know, you drop, or drop one drop, and we, we, you know, we can put you in that category in their minds. When we lived in Staten Island, we used to get chased from school, like junior high, like almost every day. Like it was a, it was a major thing. As opposed to 
you know, when I was hanging out in, in even when we was in Staten Island, when I was when I was hanging out in, in like Park Hill and those places like where the Wu Tang is from, and anytime I was around, uh, you know, uh, mainly around people of color, they were they were all way more accepting. They were like, if you got any part black, then you're black. You know, like come, you know what I mean? And we were all, a lot of us at that time, you know, there were a lot of mutts, you know, like like me. And they were way more accepting. And I just felt like, you know, I'm just gonna go where, you know, I feel like I'm wanted. Like I feel like I'm appreciated. You know, and if, if the white folks had done that, I might've been dealing with them in some kind of way, but they weren't. They were very, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, standoffish and hateful and all that kind of stuff. So, and people of color in my family, were just like you know, my you know, my they used to make fun of me. Come here, look at me, boy. Uh, look at them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and they, you know, the Jamaicans are just a fun-loving, passionate people. And um, I can remember early on being with with uh, my Jamaican family, and they would send me to Jamaica for the summer. And I would go there the first few times I went there. I didn't understand what anyone <laughs> said. Your patois was pretty bad. Oh huh? my God. They, and I, and, but I was, just, you know, I was a little actor back then. I was just trying to play it off. You know what I mean? They said, what boy got to tell him when I'm going by the road and I'm saying, what, what, what you got to do? And I'm like, well, there you go. <laughs> you, know, you, just gotta, <laughs> you know, you just gotta play it off. Well, there we are. And then, what boy don't even know when I have a scene I'm going to go and what's that? You're plowing your mouth. But after a while, you know, you 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 know, my ear got yeah. you know, my ear got better, and but it was always you know, it was always um, it was always love, and so that that's what I was attracted to. So that that and that's how I grew up from the age of nine on. Uh, it was it was um, it was you know, all black everything pretty much. Okay, so you went to Bronx High School, Bronx High School of Science. Aha, the Bronx High School of Science, the prestigious. <laughs> <laughs> Bronx High School of Science. Do you know about all the famous people that went to the Bronx High School of Science? Let me hear about it. You know John Cryer went to the Bronx High School of Science? Okay. John Cryer. Yeah. He's a couple years ahead actor. of me, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And lots of uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners and the Secretaries of Defense. And, oh, look at, and kid from Kid and Play. <laughs> <laughs> so you were like a really studious kid. You're you're a nerdy kid. It's, and I was. Yeah. I was up until I discovered hip hop. It all went downhill from there. Well, no, well, I, I think it went uphill. <laughs> I, I, I beg to differ. I think downhill in terms of Bronx Science High School. Oh, totally Bronx. <laughs> I of, barely got out. I right. barely got. I had to do summer school like my last two years. <laughs> you know, we were we had the answers. You know, the people always think like uh, at a school like Bronx High School of Science, which is very prestigious. You know, to this day. Um, but you know, some of the kids that were there, I mean, they were you know they were rich white kids. Um, and every year we had the answers to the regents, you know what I mean? Like we were, we were, they were scandalous, you know? So, um, I think a lot of us were smart, but some of us were, were smart and lazy. Um, but like I said, to me, like my junior, no, not my junior year, like my sophomore year was when I really, um, got into hip hop and, you know, doing my best in, in high school was, took a back seat. But, but then that was tough too, because my father was. He was tough, you know. You know, you know Jamaicans is all in education. Right. In education. Right. He didn't come all the way here from Jamaica for you to be a rapper. Yeah, yeah, I didn't swim all the way here. <laughs> swim all the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he used to tell me. He said, I didn't swim all the way to this country to have you act like a fool. <laughs> Your hair look crazy. <laughs> like it. Okay, so you were in a crew called the Turnout Brothers. Right. A local okay. local crew in uh, Queens, New York. Mm-hmm. And you were a rapper back then? Yeah, yeah, I was a rapper. Um, we had um, it was these local crews. You know, a lot of a lot of neighborhoods had them. And in the it was a neighborhood that Play and I grew up in. He was in a different group. He was in a group called the Super Lovers, mm -hmm. and I was in another group called the Turnout Brothers. And you know, it was like you know, friendly, competitive type stuff. You would make up routines and you know, sing and rap in uh, in my basement, in in our house. And um, you know, we had a lot of fun being just being creative. You know, we didn't know. We had no clue or or think that it could go beyond our neighborhoods, and that's what we would do. We did neighborhood shows, block parties, sweet sixteens, uh, you know, Flushing High School, you know, this and that, uh, and that was it. You know, you had to be, you know, we, we were hood famous, right? And you guys formed a group called the Fresh Force Crew. That's Play and I's first group. Yeah, 
see now the uh, both our individual groups kind of disintegrated. You know, everybody could start doing their own thing and mm -hmm. or getting discouraged and whatever. And me and Play, even though we were in different groups, we would hang out all the time. Um, and so we were just like, well, you know, me and you should do something. We hang out every freaking day. Um, let's do something. And that that was our first. That was the first iteration of Kid and Play. We called ourselves uh, Fresh Force. Okay, now and we were very, very whack. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were the the school kid, right? But Play was a stick up kid. Yeah, he was a stick up kid. He was a stick up kid. He was a ne'er do well. He was. Um, I think. I think. I think he ended up going to like five different high schools. Like he went to every high school in our zone, and then finally ended up getting his GED. Um, but yeah, we were we were kind of when we first met and started kicking it, we were kind of like polar opposites. I was really nerdy. I had a big afro and thick, thick glasses. You know what I mean? I was just afro like, first. I had a huge afro, uh -huh. and I had the Coke bottle glasses because you know my family is blind as bats, <laughs> and um, and and in play was like the real smooth, suave, you know. All fresh clothes, all kind of stuff. The rayon. He had everything. He had the Lee, he had the Lee jeans with the permanent crease. And, oh yeah. And he was an artist too. He could draw really well. Nice. And he would um with the bell bottom joints, it had a lot of room, so he would put these designs on the bell bottom. He did that mm -hmm. for himself and for people in the neighborhood. Like he, he was fly. Before I met him, I used to see him at the at the park jams. I'd be like, yo, that dude looks cool, man. Like the whole then they whole crew, him, Herbie Lovebug, all those guys. This is before I got in with them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was just kind of checking them out. And, um, you know, we just kind of, we kind of discovered each other. Well, didn't you and Salt and Pepper all work at the Sears together? Yeah. Now, I did, we didn't all work there at the same time. Um, this was like a Sears and Roebuck at service center where they, like, call you up and mm -hmm. to ask if you want a maintenance agreement or something like that. Um, Play worked there first. Then I got there. Then I think Herbie got there. <laughs> then I think me and Play got fired. Then Salt, you know, Salt and Pepper, Sandy and Cheryl came there. And um, and then across the street, there was a gas station across the street that Martin Lawrence worked at. He used to pump <laughs> gas at the Hess gas station across the street. Wow. And then he got fired from there and ended up working at Sears too. So I don't know, we all worked there at the same time. But at one point we all worked there, but and we all became friends. Like you know, Herbie was was dating Salt, and they mm -hmm. were starting to you know make music and stuff like that. But yeah, we all knew each other way before any of us popped. Right, and Salt and Pepper came out first. Salt and Pepper came out way first. Way first, thank and God. Herbie Lovebug produced them. Herbie Lovebug invented them, produced, produced them, them, introduced everything. them. Because when Pusha came out, right, that was out of there. That was, I think. Was that the biggest female hip hop record at that time? I mean, by that time? Absolutely. Because that was bigger than all the MC Light stuff and everything. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. No, and before that, you know, they had made a name for themselves, you know, just in the tri-state area, you know, with the, you know, they did a, a answer record to uh, Dougie Fresh's The Show, called The Showstopper. And then that's, uh, that's you know, originally their name was uh, Super Nature, but they had changed it to Salt and Pepper because, you know, with the Salt and Pepper MC, or One Light, One Dark, whatever, whatever. Um, but yeah, by the time they got to push it, they were out of here, and they they, they they were the first in our in our group to pop off, go on tour. They were on the Wipeout tour with the Fat Boys. It was on this tour, that tour, and eventually um, we ended up opening for them um, on the ooh, what was it called? Slamming '88. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, we were all thing. You know, we were all kind of one kind of hip hop family, and uh, you know, Herbie was actually doesn't get enough credit if you ask me. But you know, before the, you know, before the Puffies and some of these other cats got their whole crew together, mm -hmm. that that's what that's what Herbie did. And Herbie's design was, look, whoever pops off first, and that in our case it was Salt and Pepper. We're gonna use Salt and Pepper. We're gonna utilize Salt and Pepper to help the other groups in the uh, in, in the in the clan, the Kid and Plays, the Dana Danes, the Sweet Teas, the Kwames, and that's what we did. And when it was our turn, when we started blowing up, then boom. Kwame, be in our video. You know, that was that was the mindset. Okay, so you guys get a record deal with Select Records? 
Yep, that was yeah. This that was the, our second record deal after the Fresh Force situation. Oh, so you guys flamed out. Okay, so you guys had a yeah, deal that was for on the Fresh Su- Force. Yeah, okay, that was on Sutra it. Records, the old Fat Boys label. Mm-hmm. And so we had a couple of singles on that, and you know, it kind of flamed out. Um, and we, you know, then we we um, you know we were kind of out there, uh, still you know still wanting to do stuff together. You know, Herbie's still around. He's in our neighborhood, and um, we were like, "Yo, man, you know." help us you know what i mean you're right now he was he was hot as he was hot as fish grease with all the salt and pepper stuff so uh, he had a reputation that could get us another deal somewhere else so he helped us get the deal over at uh select records and by then we had changed our name to kid and play okay so then in 88 you come out with the first album well i guess the first real album for yeah the first album we we dropped we dropped like some we, singles we dropped before. some singles in 87 right okay. like last night changed it all came out 87 okay but the first yeah the first two hype album uh, 88. So you drop two hype. Yeah. And it goes gold. It does go gold. And rolling with Kid and Play. <laughs> That's what that, they told us. <laughs> probably did more. Yeah. Probably. Back then, oh yeah, triple platinum. You think, it only goes gold. For, you think the paperwork only says gold. It stopped at 500,000. I don't know what happened. It hasn't they sold. just stopped the buying it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, man. 501,000 dollars and 501,000 copies. Who would have known? <laughs> yeah, I'm still waiting for my documentaries on the, I mean, I'm still waiting on my royalties from documentaries oh, that I came out copy, with that, right? that I've never gotten. Right, okay, so this comes out Rolling with Kid and Play was the big song on there. Yes. Which was kind of a go-go record. Yes. We we infused it with go-go. Yeah. Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, um, Herbie had, Herbie as a producer was into go-go at the time, mm-hmm. you know, and I, th- I think he thought it was going to break really wide, which it never really did, but right, cause, uh, he did Shake Your Thing. With with salt and pepper, which was right. a big hit, which oh, right. was a go-go record. You're right, yeah. And then uh, doing the butt was out, yeah, kind of around out. that yeah, time. Yeah. So and those were big records. So I, I could see where, where he yeah, was going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No question. And we do, you know, we 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 were very popular in D.C. You know, we were doing a lot bet. of shows. You know, D.C., uh, Philly, you yeah. know, New York. We had all that. Connecticut. We all had that on lock. So um, Herbie had go-go on his mind, and I had the idea to flip uh, this old R&B record. Um, by a group called Ripple. And so we just kind of, you know, we just kind of combined it. So, um, you know, we put that, you know, with that Ola Ola A with that with that go-go swing on it and it just worked. And, you know, we're talking about 88, 89. That's when, that's when go-go was bubbling where people thought maybe it had a chance to kind of, to, you know, really break out, uh, which it never did. But um, yeah, to this day, that's our, that's our closer, man. It's your biggest record. It's it's our it's our big it's 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 our most popular record. You know, I don't know. I think maybe ain't gonna hurt nobody. Maybe might have sold a little bit more. Yeah. But but um, you know, people want to hear that Ola Ola A and you know, kick your feet together. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the video, first of all, you come out with a high top fade, which was like right. ten inches tall. I don't know. It was pretty a big, foot though. tall it was at this pretty, point. Pretty big. And I'm sure that there were other kids in the neighborhood who had this. But were you the first person on TV to have that hairstyle? You know, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I mean, I think that had a lot to do with it. I mean, and at that time, you know, we had had like several music videos out. You know what I mean? And we would stuff like your MTV rap. So you know, we were, you know, we were in your face. And and um, so I think that had a lot to do with it. I mean, yeah, there were cats in New York that that had high tops and some bigger than mine. But I think I think it was a combination of. You know, the hair, the how he had it, you know, this crazy looking face, you know, like, man, you know, the eyes, everything, you know, this is just like, like, there's nobody that looks like, you know, I'm looking like, I'm looking like Beaker. <laughs> what's the hell, the Muppets? <laughs> Don't do any crimes, because <laughs> exactly. people will be pointed in the line. Exactly, I'm, like, I'm easy. <laughs> um, so I think we had a, we had a, and then I think, you know, because we were, you know, we were, we were doing the dancing and, you know, play was, was kind of like our, our, our wardrobe, you know, our kind of uh, um, fashion dude. So he always had us in some fly shit, uh, and um, you know, it was weird. The the mentality and and that we had back then. I, I see I see a lot of artists today when they come up. It's right off the rip. They just like, you know, look like us, dance like us, act like us, do everything like us, be like us. But when we were coming up, we were like the total opposite. We were like, don't do this. <laughs> like we were like we were so arrogant, you know what I mean, or or just 
arrogant or innocent or both. We were just like, yo, don't we do this. You don't do this. You don't do this like we do this. You don't you don't do this. We do this. You don't uh uh-uh. uh you don't do no, we do this. We didn't want people to to emulate us. Mm-hmm. But that's when they did. That I don't know if that was that triggered something that was like, you know, like fuck you, kid Blake, we're gonna fuck you. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's what but we our mentality, you know, and Kwame was the same way. Kwame was, you know, he was like, yo, we wanna be the only people you know that look like this, act like this, dance like this, rap like this. You know, nobody ever heard of female MCs rap like Salt and Pepper before. I mean, that was by design. I mean, and Herbie the same way. The the way he would teach us how to rap. You know, you would you know, MCs before they wouldn't you know necessarily rap with, um, they would rap with emotion. You know, like motherfucker, I'm a butter in the motherfucking head. You know, rap with emotion, but they wouldn't rap with feelings. You know what I mean? Herbie have you Herbie have you in the studio all damn day just trying to get when I'm so when I know and I don't even know <laughs> you know get the oh, you got to get the little inflections and you know I'll take your man you know what I mean type stuff so it was it was new ground and we were of the opinions it's like yo we just want to we just want to be the ones that do this kind of style and overall um, I mean no disrespect to anybody I mean but and and. We wanted to do it because the time at that time in New York, uh, if you're talking late '80s, the competition was was really really fierce. You know, there was a lot of great seminal groups that came up in that you know '88 '89 era. You know, we we're competing against Big Daddy Kane and we're competing against the Special Eds and we're competing against the Super Lover Seeds and Casanova Ruds and we're competing against the Stetsasonics and you know, but but if you one of the things I, I, I'm reminded of is when you go back to that era, man, there were so many different styles. Like, boom, as soon as you heard an artist, you're like, yo, that's dude. Boom, that's Kane. Boom, that's Stetsa. That's Gangstar. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, if there's, I don't want to be like the old man, get off my lawn, rapper, <laughs> old man, get off my lawn. You know what I mean? But I hear, I hear, today I hear like more things more like, uh, than different, and I just remember at that particular time, and so we we wanted to set ourselves apart because we felt that gave us the best opportunity to to be successful. Well, even though you did the kickstep dance and the do the my way video, yeah, this was the video that I think kind of set it off. What the, the Rolling with Kidden play video? Yeah, the the, the kickstep dance because yeah. not only did you do the dance, but you also kind of did the 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 jump around part in right. the dance, which I think kind of what makes it in right. a way. Yeah, I, I think that's what made it totally different. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, we we did we did the um we did the kid and play in our first video, do this my way. Mm-hmm. We did it in our second video, Game Funky, mm-hmm. a little, little bit at the end. But you're right, the third video was uh, Rolling with Kid and Play, where we did the where we hook our feet and, and it bounce yeah, around, bounce around, and all yeah, that. yeah. That and that was a that was a yeah that was that was a game changer. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's over the years. And people still doing to this day. I mean, I, I get so many videos, and people will tag me on Instagram, um, and and everybody knows it. I saw something the other day where um, Offset was doing it with his moms right. at a party. You know what I mean? I'm get, I'm not, and it's it's we didn't know that it would still be popping to this day. I mean, we're very thankful for that. Um, but. Yeah, it's a dance you got to do with somebody, and preferably somebody you know that knows how to do it. You know what I mean? You, or else you just just kicking somebody in the leg, like motherfucker, fuck! I don't even know you. You just kicking me in the leg for you know? And you know you got to hook your legs, and you're gonna grab, and you can go around, and it's a very it's a celebratory dance. You know, right? It, it means it means it's it's a happy dance. Yeah, I mean LeBron James had a State Farm commercial I years know. later where he did that dance. Thanks, LeBron. <laughs> Thanks, LeBron and Steve Stout. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, I think, wasn't there like a, a Cameron music video where he did like a Jerry Springer kind of like Oh, no, I didn't even parody, see that. Parody, and then like when they find out he wasn't the father, he starts doing that no! dance with like oh. his man or oh, something I gotta like see that. that. I got to see it. Look, I've seen that. I've seen I've seen Fabulous and Chris Brown do it in a video. Um, I've seen so many famous people kind of do it and... Um, Oh man, what's his name? Told me something the other day, man. I was uh, I was going back and forth with Questlove, and Questlove said, "Yo, I got to tell you a story." And I was like, "What's up?" And he was like, "Yo, we did this." Um, he 
said when Obama was still president, he said we did a uh, we did an event up there at the White House, and he said um, he said Obama and them started doing the kid and play, and I was like I was like nigga stop it. He's like yeah. I'm like what? So you know it, it's 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 bigger than us, but I mean we're we're obviously very much closely associated with it, and you know when you know before this pandemic went down, I mean we were you know touring all over the place and. Yeah. Um, you know, Play and I was still just kind of marvel, man. We'd be in, you know, be in front of, uh, you know, you know, X amount of thousands of people, and we're doing the dance, and you know, we save it for the end, like we know, you know what I mean? Like we, <laughs> we ain't gonna do it at the beginning. We gonna wait at the end, and we hit that sucker at the end. And everybody going crazy, and while we're doing it, we just like, can you believe this shit? <laughs> Thirty years believe, later, I can't believe this shit. <laughs> oh, we're <my> back. <laughs> Where's the asper cream? <laughs> well. Unlike most of the other rap groups during that time, you guys had really like positive lyrics, right? Really pop friendly yeah. kind of songs, and yeah. I think you had said once that we were the one rap group that <laughs> white people didn't have to fear if they saw us at an ATM. I did say that. <laughs> I did say that. Well, because you know, it, and it was that era too. You know, it was Kid and Play, it was Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And 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 it was by design. First of all, it was who we were. Like we weren't. Hard rocks, like you know, we our neighborhood. Well, yeah, well, play. Yeah, well, was, yeah, was but by people. then, by then, yeah, but by then he had seen the light. Okay, okay so yeah, yeah, that. You yeah, yeah I got him into GED every day. I was like, dude, your your way ain't working. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you need to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Stop selling crack and crack a book. <laughs> Let's go. So, uh, so, so play was no play was off that by then. He was he was you know well on his way to you know uh, living positively and. You know, that's the thing we were into at that time. We we loved music, um, we loved fashion, we loved to dance, and we loved girls. And that's and so that's what we talked about. And um we we and we could we felt like we could talk about that intelligently and you know, we couldn't you know, anytime we try to do like some really hard, hard record, it just fell flat. Like people are just like, nah. Not really. <laughs> you shot who? You going okay. what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What you got? What shot you had? <laughs> Vaccine? <laughs> well, so you come out with this album, Too Hype. It goes gold. And now you guys are, are known. And was it right afterwards when the animated cartoon came out? Um, no, actually, that the, the animated cartoon came about um, after um, House Party came out. Oh, that came later. Yeah, that came later because that that after, uh -huh. after house party, that was that was the the second game changer. Got it. Okay, so let, so let's go ahead and just do this yeah. in order then. So after the first album comes out, yeah, house party the movie comes together. Right, it comes together. Um, we were, um, you know, the two hype album was doing really well. We're touring all over the country. You know, initially we were, um, like I said, we were opening for Salt and Pepper, but. After a while, you know what I mean, we we were our weight was we were getting our weight up and we were touring with everybody. We were touring with Guy, we were touring with Tony Tony Tony, we were touring with MC Hammer, uh, we were touring with Public Enemy. Uh and uh during that time, um, you know, we're in New York and everything is hot. We got we got, you know, two, three hot videos out, and a cat used to come up to me all the time. I was always the one hanging out in the clubs and stuff, and a cat used to come up to me all the time. And give me his card and talk to me. He said, "Hey man, you know me and my brother got this company, man. I want you know we'd love to shoot some of your music videos. I mean, the music video director." I was like, "Yeah, man, it's cool. You know, all right, cool. You know, we had a guy at the time. We had this white dude that we worked with at the time who we had a nice relationship with, and we were, you know, when nothing was broke. So, it was, but I had the dude's card, and I'm like, all right, cool. And then another time he comes to me and says, "Hey man, I got a movie script. I wrote a movie script that I want you and play to consider." And come to find out, this is Reggie Hudlin, mm -hmm. the producer, director, uh, writer of House Party, you know, along with his brother, Warrington. So um, they um, back in those days, it was usually my job to read stuff for the crew. You know what I mean? Like if it was a script or some proposal or something, yo, let kid read it. You know what I mean? I'm, yeah, I, I had it. That's, my, that's what my college degree was worth. So yeah, let kid read it. And then I break it down to them and, and break it down what's going on. So they gave me the script uh, for House Party, and I read it. And I had read a, a few different movie scripts that they had um, people had put forth for us, and none of them had really grabbed me at all. They were just they were really they were just corny. Um, and obviously, like I told you, we thought we was the shit, so we just like we ain't doing no corny shit. But I read House Party, 
And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, you know what? I was like, it's like, it's like 70% there. And that's what I told Play and that's what I told Herbie Lovebug. I said, you know what? It's like 70% there. It's like the best thing I've ever read that, that had been submitted to us. And I said, I think we can get it the rest of the way. I think if they let us do our thing and bring, you know, some hip hop credibility to it, you know, whatever we could bring musically, lyrically, uh, style wise, culturally, that we could get it there. And so I told him that. So that's when we went down. Reggie and them had us come down to New Line Cinema. And um, we, um, you know, they kind of interviewed us. You know, they had us play and I read some scenes and then do like some improv to, to check the chemistry. And, um, and I, remember, I remember thinking that day when we met with, you know, these were stuffy white folks and stuff. You know what I mean? Um, I don't think they realized what they was, they was getting. And... Um, I remember leaving that meeting saying, "Well, shit, we ain't gonna do this movie." But I think I thought I thought we I thought we bombed. You know what I mean? But what happened was we left their office and we were right there on 14th Street in the city. And one of the New Line executives said, "Hey, man, you know what? I'll, I'll walk you guys down, man. You know, blah blah blah." So the New Line person comes down with us, and it just so ha happened that when we were getting out of this office building, there was a high school like right down the block. And it was like around three o'clock. So high school had just let out. So we're like on the street. And so all these high school kids come and they and they get a load of us. And you know, like I said, we were super hot right then. Man, these kids are going buck fucking wild. Going uh -huh. wild. And the executive's like, she's looking at this like, you know what I mean? So that was the best thing, the best, you know, kind of send off that we could have because it showed that, you know, people, you know, the fans and the kids were really feeling us. Um, and then, you know, we, you know, we ended up putting it together. Um, you know, I know there was talk at that time that it was uh, between Kid and Play and Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Right. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, there, there's, there's some truth to that as far as, far as I was uh, told. Well, Jazzy Jeff had, a, I guess, an interview where he talked about it. Mm -hmm. This is what he said. He said uh, when, you know, Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince did Nightmare on My Street, New yep. Line Cinema sued the hell out of them. That's right. But uh, they liked the record, and they thought that uh, the two of them were talented from parents just don't understand. So part of the settlement was that they had to pay New Line a bunch of money, but they also offered scripts for the movies. And the first script, he said, was House Party. So if you think about the premise of House Party, one dude was a DJ and one dude was a rapper. So it was set up for Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince. We were thinking about doing movies back then, and then Kid and Play blew up off of that. That yeah. was Jazzy Jeff's version of that story. Yeah, no, and I, and I love Jazzy. No, that sounds that sounds very accurate. I mean, like I said, I knew we knew that there was beef between New Line and and Jeff and them behind that song, and so you know, it, it, you know, it came out in kind of different ways. You know, I, I, you know, if they passed on it or or they were just like, we don't want to fuck with you, New Line, because we we we're, we're in litigation. You know, or we yeah. just went through something with y'all. So, but look. Those things have a way of happening, like you know what I mean. Like if they passed on that and we got it, that was amazing. You know, we had a we had a television deal at NBC before Fresh Prince, right? And we turned that down, and they end up getting that. Right. How'd that work out? Yeah, <laughs> you know it's kind of it went it went backwards. Yeah. I was going to talk about that, right? Because I guess yeah. later on when you guys had the animated. Uh, Oh, cartoon. God. Don't get me started. <laughs> right. When you guys had the animated cartoon, after one season it was canceled. That's right. And you know, the, the TV company said, We have a sitcom for you. Yeah. We had two, we had two TV deals over yeah. at, at NBC. One was for the, the animated uh cartoon series, Kid mm -hmm. and Play cartoon. First rappers to ever have a cartoon, right? Before Hammer for everybody. Mm -hmm. And we were so proud of it, man. Because, you know, we were like young kids. You know, we were cartoon kids. So we were like, yeah, what the fuck are we the fucking cartoon, man? You know what I'm saying? And we, we loved it. But what happened was, this was about the time when uh, NBC was flipping it, flipping Saturday morning into live action. They were like, fuck these cartoons. We want to do the Saved by the Bells. And, you know, those kind of shows. They, they started calling it TNBC. And we kind of got caught up in the in the middle of that. Like, I mean, the cartoon did what it did, but I think it was a, I think it was bigger than us. It was just like, look, we we getting we're not doing cartoons no more. We're doing the the the, the trend is to live action, mm -hmm. and we got caught up in you know caught up in that. And so we had the cartoon deal, and we had a sitcom deal. 
at NBC. Man, we so, we are so emotional about losing the cartoon series that we told them, we told our people to tell Warren Littlefield, who was running NBC at the time, we was like, man, this is how smart we were, right? We was like, man, fuck your fucking TV show. You clip this cartoon, we don't want it. We don't want your sitcom. Fucking tear up the shit. We don't want to do a sitcom with you if you cut the cartoon. That's what we told him. And our management was like, you motherfuckers are crazy. What the f You fucking queens motherfuckers. And that's what we did. So they, you know what I'm saying? That deal went away. That's the deal that, and uh, Jeff and them, Will and them slid right up in that. That was the shit. We'd have had, we'd have had that shit first. We'd have had both. Oh, yeah. Quincy Jones said, How'd that work out? What, what happened to, happened to Will Smith? What, what happened to that guy? He does <laughs> movies every so often. Little bit, <laughs> bit roles here right. and there. Heard right. he had some kids. Yeah. Married right. an actress right. somewhere. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, Something God. Something about entanglements. Wait. Anyway, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, Black yeah. gonna get me shot. <laughs> so, the sitcom deal that you guys turned, out, turned down ended up becoming the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yep. It will. It That's out. my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, which was which which, but you know what? It taught it taught me so many lessons. We've been doing this thing so long, right? So, and I don't. You're never too old to learn lessons, but you know this is early in the game. And one of the things that taught us was you can't make these emotional decisions. You know what I mean? That was that was that was an error. You know that was a mistake. You know, like you said, Jeff and them might say. You know, we turned down house party because, you know, we might have been emotional for that because mm -hmm. we was like, ah, we ain't fucking with you. But that would have been a great opportunity for them. I'm, I have no doubt if them two, if they did house party, it would have been it would have been a hit oh, as, yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And if we had did the, the sitcom, trust me, I, we would have did well at that. You know what I mean? We were always, you know, kind of on the same, you know, kind of level, kind of vibe. Um, but yeah, it taught us like you can't make these decisions rashly or emotionally you got to sleep on it you got to think on it you got to think about the long-term effects um so yeah that was uh you know we 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 blew that one <laughs> i mean but we got you know we had other tv deals after that and shot yeah. pilots and stuff like that but that would have been a golden opportunity because the lane was wide open there was nobody else there at the time well you guys do house party and the cast on this is very interesting robin harris played your dad the late great. Oh, man. One of the greats. One of the absolute greats that would have been a monster oh. if, he had, if he had lived longer. Stop it. Martin Lawrence and Tisha Campbell mm -hmm. were both in this film. Absolutely. Later on, they would do Martin together. Yeah, he stole my girl. You <laughs> stole my girl, Martin. <laughs> and you end up doing the Martin theme song, right? I did. Yeah? I did, along with a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Stephen Kitt. Um yeah, because, you know, at the time, you know, this is when Martin and I were like super, super tight. Mm -hmm. And um, I can remember him, they did, he did the uh, pilot, excuse me, did the pilot for Fox. And I remember I was, I was, I wasn't living out here in LA yet, um, but I was out here at the, um, you know, it's the London now, it used to be called the Bellage. Mm -hmm. So I'm staying at the Bellage. So he comes by with a, a, another friend, uh, Benley Evans, to show me the pilot of Martin. And he puts it in, he throws it in, he's in my suite, we watch it. I'm like, yo, this shit, this shit is dope. You know what I'm saying? It's funny, it's this and that. And Martin's like, yo, man, you need to be on, be on the show, be on the show with me, man. Come on, be a guest star on the show. I'm like, all right, fuck it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Then we're in the room, and it's me, Martin, and uh, Benley Evans. And we just start just thinking about, like, what like, what could it be? And, I'm, you know, we're thinking out loud, and I'm like, well, if I'm on and I'm being myself, why don't we have... Some way we gotta have kid and the, that Shanene character, that girl character, have them like hook up. Maybe they maybe they go on a date or something like. That. So mm -hmm. we start putting together. He's like, all right, well, what if she on a radio station and she wins a date and da 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 da. So you know we just started putting it together. So then we you know he and I were up. We're we're actually in my room. We're like you know kind of holding each other like we're dancing. And 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 I remember going through my mind uh, at at that time. Forever my lady was super super hot record. So, you know, my mind is a rapid. Always, you always think of my forever, my lady, forever, Shanene. You know what I mean? My mind works like that to, you know, how can I make, make it rhyme and make it, you know, it's the same mind that gives you Ola, Ola, A, rolling, rolling, rolling with kid and play. So I'm like, like forever, forever, my lady, for, no, no, call it forever, Shanene. And then it was this and that. And then my man, Bentley Evans, he had never written nothing before in his life. Not like, not like that, like a, like a, you know, a sitcom script. 
And he's sitting in the corner, scribbling it down, getting notes and this and that. Two weeks later, I get a script at, at, at my crib in, in, uh, in Jersey. It says, Forever Shanene. And came out a few weeks later to do it. And, it, you know, it became one of the most classic uh, episodes in the history of Martin. And, and it was, I think it was crucial because this was his first season. You know, and, and that's, you know, it was really important for him to get through that first season and, and be a success. So, you know, when it came down, I was, you know, that's how we all were. Like, like if, if a, a friend, you know, if he asked me to do it, I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm gonna do it. You know, do I, do I know how much I'm getting? Nah, it doesn't matter. Like, you my boy, we're gonna do this. This is your first season, let's knock it out the park, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you know, when, when it came time for him and, and Tommy Davidson to come in some of our music video, you know, everybody helped each other back then. It was very mm -hmm. kind of community kind of kind of vibe. Um, but yeah, we did that. Um, we did that and it became, you know, you know, it was funny. Years later, years later, um, me and Martin hooked back up and um, I went to dinner at his house and um, me and him was just kicking it, catching up and whatnot. And he had um, a couple of his daughters that were there. And, you know, they were so cute. I mean, I was probably, probably like nine or ten at the time. And they going to throw in the, the tape of, of that Martin episode. <laughs> you know what I mean? With me and him in it and, you know, all hugged up and whatnot. And they're just sitting there cackling in it. And then me and Martin look at each other like, can you believe this shit? Like, can you believe it? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Once again, it's just like you never think at the time that these things will still be you know, beloved and and uh, and sought out after all these yeah. years and stuff. But you know, people still do. So that's 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 the beauty of it. it and it and it and it doesn't make. I, you know, I can speak for myself and, and and play as well. It doesn't make it doesn't make us arrogant or or big headed. It actually is more humbling than anything else. It's just like wow, like y'all, you really do like us. <laughs> well, John Witherspoon was in that film as well. John he played uh, the angry neighbor, the angry. public enema. Oh my God. <laughs> Let me tell you something. One of the greats, and you know, and I learned, we learned so much from, from you know, some of the vets like, like Spoon, um, you know, John Witherspoon, you know, Robin Harris's, um, you know, the Ronaldo Rays, you know, the Bernie Max, you know, when we had some, some of the OGs that came and, and performed with us, we were always very appreciative and we learned a lot and we asked a lot of questions and then, you know, when I got into doing stand up, you know, I would run into uh, to John Witherspoon and he would always have something positive or something, you know, some advice that I could use. You know what I mean? So those those days were great. Like we weren't, you know, and we weren't even making a lot of money back then. You know what I'm saying? I'll tell you a quick story about uh, Robin Harris. You know, he and I spent a lot of time together because, you know, we were father and son in the movie. So, we, you know, we did a lot of scenes together and spent a lot of time. So back then they would literally give you um, paychecks you know we had like paychecks every week and so uh, one week we got our paychecks and robin was like yo man where you know what you doing where you, where you going i said like, i don't know i'm gonna go you know cash this check and shit he's like yo come with me come with me <laughs> so he used to drive this 5.0 so we driving at 5.0 so robin he's gonna take me robin harris takes me to the bank that he used to work at as a security guard <laughs> that's where he want to go cash his check you come in, hey, you motherfuckers. I told you I was going to make it, and I got a kid with me. So like, I was like, where are we going? He said, don't worry, motherfucker. We would have cashed these goddamn checks. And we went into some, some bank that where he used to be a security guard. And they was coming in there, and he was giving them the fucking business. Yeah, cash my check, bitch. What the fuck you talking about? I told you. Right? Like, I'm rich, bitch. He would, he would do stuff like that. We'd be driving around. He be talking shit to the cops, you know what I mean? He always had he always had a pistol. <laughs> really? The seat. Oh my god! Oh, the wow. fucker kept it under the five point He had a pistol, pistol right here. Wow! Pistol okay. right here. We used to play. We all used to play basketball together too, right? It used to be me, um, Martin, Tommy Davidson, Tommy Ford that was on uh, Martin, mm -hmm. and some other friends. And Robin would play sometimes too. Like he wasn't a really good player, but you know he just go you know get a, get a sweat. So one day we playing we playing over there in Burbank near where um where Martin lived, this gym. And it was something we you know we got into it with these with these cats, man, for some reason. You know, we start beefing and whatever, whatever. And some cats, you know, a couple white dudes, whatever like that, they talking shit. And um Robin was like, Robin was like, what? He said, he said, yo, wait, wait up, wait up real quick. Robin go out to the car. 
come back with the strap. He got the strap on him. He got it. He got gym clothes on everything. He got the jammy. He got the jammy right here at the hip. And he's like, what you said, motherfucker? What you said? And they're like, rub, 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 rub. And you know, he's like typical Robbie. I thought, I thought that's what you said, motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, Robin took care of us. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he took care of us. Like he roasted the shit out of us. You know what I mean? Like that's when we used to like it. We, we used to go like set him off. Like, hey, Robin, who like, motherfucker? What you talking about? You know, we would want to get, get cut up. You know what I'm saying? But he, you know, it was just a beautiful time. You know, like I said, we weren't making any money, but um, everybody from Robin, you know, Full Force were great. Um, yeah. You know, Tisha, AJ, um, you know what I mean? Uh, Spoon. Uh, it was just, uh, you know, it was, uh, they were, it was really the wonder years. And, and Re you know, Reggie, everybody ran new. Nobody had ever, but most of us had never done a movie before. And, you know, we kind of trusted in each other. We had a, we had a, a fucking blast and we made history. Wait, let me tell you a qu quick story, quick story. This is right before House Party's getting ready to come out. Mm -hmm. So, um. The new line calls us and they say, yo, man, we're doing a screening for um, these kids, these high school kids in Newark. Uh, you know, they invited us to go. So I was like, ah, yeah, let's, let's go. So what they did was had us in this, this old theater in Newark and we were up in the balcony. So the kids couldn't see us. They didn't know we were there. So they're down on the floor and everything like that. And initially we thought they were just going to show like a, you know, like a trailer or just like some clips. But they ended up showing the whole fucking movie. And so we're watching, it's the first time playing I've seen the movie. So we're up in the balcony, they can't see us, they're down below, we can see them. And the, the movie begins and man, these kids are going off. Okay, so the, the movie begins and the kids are going off, man. They're having a blast, they're laughing, they're up and down the aisles, they're, and we was just like, wow, this is crazy. So then it finally gets to the scene, there's a scene where, um, you know, I've been getting chased all night and I finally, I'm getting run away from full force and this and that. And finally, I, 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 I get to a safe place. And then I see Play and Martin and the girls driving by in the little yellow car. And I'm, I'm like waving. I'm like, yo, 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 like, you know, this and that. And Play drives right by. You know what I mean? And then Martin's like, yo, man, wasn't that Play? And you know, Play's like, yo, man, you know, we ain't got time. We got to get to the party. And at that point, there's a young kid downstairs that jumped out of his seat and said, Play, you ain't shit. <laughs> and no, like it was so, it was so real to them. Like, how could you do your boy like that? Your boy is running. Y'all been running for my life the whole night. You know, and the dude just the dude was like, play, you ain't shit. And we looked at each other. We were like, yo, like you know, we knew it was something special because people were really getting you know emotionally kind of uh, connected to it, like off the rip, and and that's. That part has never really ever changed, thankfully. Yeah, it comes out. I mean, I saw it in the theaters. Me and all my friends went to go see it. Great film. Comes out. It's a hit. Yeah. So now you guys are movie stars. Yep. Because you guys are on the cover. You guys are the stars. Yep. Does the Fun House album come out after that, or does House Party Two come out after? No. That? Um. Th this is this is the thing that we always that we did uh, badly. You know, for some reason. And I think it probably had a, a lot to do with the, the, our record company at the time. We always seemed like we were uh, going against the the soundtrack of the particular movie. So House Party soundtrack is out, and I think we had a we had a couple of joints on that. But we released Fun House like around the same time. Um, and I think Funhouse, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure Funhouse went gold, but yeah, it went gold. Funhouse went gold, um, but I think it could have been. I could have, with, with if the timing had been better, if we had kind of synchronized. You know what I mean? I don't know that our record company um, president was always trying to align with um, with New Line Cinema or, or whatever label had the had the soundtrack at that time. Um, but yeah, we released Funhouse about the same time, um, which had. Um, uh, which had Funhouse on it. Funhouse was a big record for us. Uh, we had a couple other joints on there as, as well. Um, 
But yeah, you it always seemed like we were like competing with ourselves. It was it was never like you see how they they synchronize it now and they have it yeah. layered and you know you roll this out and then we roll that out. We never really did that, you know. I mean, uh, but a lot of it was new to everybody. Right. So well, that song went number one on the the rap singles chart. Funhouse. Yeah, I wrote that. Nice. This party's <laughs> at the Funhouse. <laughs> so that goes gold. By the way, that album's not on Spotify. Don't get me started for that. You know what I'm saying? I'm going I'm I'm to get like boozy on it. Man, don't get me started, Vlad. Come on, Vlad. Come on, Vlad. Oh, wait, oh, wait, remind me. I have my I have my favorite moments of uh, Vlad. I got, okay. my, I, got a, I got like I got like a top five for you, man. Got but it. yeah, no, but once again, it wasn't, you know, it, we some legal drama around. Yeah, right. you know, it, it didn't work as smoothly okay. as it as it could have or should have. So then, 1991, House Party 2 comes out. That's right. Did it come out in 91 or 92? That's what it says. 91. Okay. Where, where, well, who me, who me, said let me, it? Let me double check. <laughs> let me just... Yeah, House Party 2, 1991. Okay. Now, this movie had Queen Latifah in it. Yep. Had Whoopi Goldberg in it. That's had right. Iman in it. That's right. Had a Young Black Teenagers That's in right. it. That's right. Cameron. Cameron from Young the Black original Teenagers. Cameron. The original Cameron. The white Cameron. The white camera with the dreadlocks. That's right. That was my homeboy. That was my. That was my. That was my. That was my little homie, man. Yeah, we I had think, some uh, good times. Public Enemy and the Bomb Squad were producing those guys. T Hank Shockley. Yeah, Hank Shockley. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, what you call was in there too. Um, my man. Um, was it? Um, it wasn't. Was it? The, it wasn't the Rico Suave dude. It was the other dude. Was it Geraldo? Geraldo. Geraldo. He was one of them dudes like. I don't know if it was Rico Suave, but there was another dude that was like that. He was he was down with Iman in, in the movie. But yeah, Iman was in there. It was it was crazy, man. The rap party, Dave, she brought David Bowie to the rap party. We were like, yeah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Mama I made it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember one time on the on the set, uh Cameron and um Cameron and Martin got into a fist fight. Really? Yeah, they got into a fist Cameron fight. Cameron from Young Black Teenagers yeah. and Martin Lawrence got into a fist fight. Yeah, they got into a fist fight. Over what? Um, you know what? Um, they 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 didn't like each other, like and and um, Cameron was very um, he was very New Yorky. You know, he was hard, and Martin was 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 hard headed too, and Martin was was well was is he's a boxer, like he can box, like he really knows how to box, mm -hmm. and and Cameron just liked to fight. You know, he was just very combative. Like okay. he and I would have conversations like that. I was like, yo, you gotta chill. He's like, fuck that. Dude. So we could see it brewing like over the over certain days. And there was one night we were out there, it was like three, four o'clock in the morning. We're shooting some shit. It's fucking cold outside, you know, downtown LA and shit. And, you know, somebody says something, I forgot what what tripped it, but you could see it had been brewing. And then motherfuckers just start scrapping. Bah, 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 bah. Break them up. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, it got squashed, but they were both very, very strong uh, personalities, and they both like, and they both like little, so they like, you know, they, they got that extra. Why I order? You know what I mean? You know, little dude. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You ever see like that little dog? Like little dog don't know it's oh, little. Yeah. yeah. Little dog don't know it's little. Little dog act like a big dog. So there were two little dogs acting like big dogs. They were scrapping. Yeah, it was. A, yeah, but they both, you know, that was that was still good times. And this film did well, not quite as well no, as the first as one, well. but as well. but solid. It did like twenty million at the box. We office. didn't lose no money. Didn't lose any money, right? Dang. So and we, then, had, we had some hit records off that too. Yeah. So then, Face the Nation comes out. Face the Nation. Okay. Right. Which is also not on Spotify. Let me just point. That I don't out. know. You know what? I I, I the, right to your point. I for, I forgot you had asked that. Yeah. I I don't get that, and and I don't even understand why you know the label doesn't allow that to happen. I mean, you know, they they're gonna win the most. Yeah. Okay. If they why do. Not? I don't understand. Yeah, because I mean people Sample ask that all the time. Maybe or yeah, it's the same way they ask like why they never released the movie Class Act on, on digital, you mm. know, like back in the days. Like okay. what do, what do you like why would you not why would yeah. you not do that? You already have you know it. what I'm saying? Yeah, you already own it. Okay. And ain't gonna hurt nobody. That's Ain't Gonna Hurt Nobody was, was on, on that album. Was on Face the Nation. Exactly. Yeah. Which went number one on the rap charts. Thank God. That was that was that was the easily the best record on that um on that uh, on that record. You know what I mean? I like that album, but you know, it was getting tougher and tougher 
to make to make records. You know what I mean? And I think uh, you know I'm sure our, our artists have told you that like like the bigger we were getting the more other shit we were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we were doing, you know, other television shows and you know, the cartoon is here and this is that. You know, Play has got his clothing business. You know, I start managing uh, and producing groups with Steve Stout. Everybody, you know, people are kind of, everyone's all over the place. And when it's time to get back to making a record, it's it's not the same thing. And by then, by, by the time Face the Nation comes around, Herbie's, we're not working with Herbie. Herbie's not executive producing it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, it, it kind of fell to me a lot to try to, to try to get a lot of things done and, and, and you know, write the material and kind of put it together and set it up. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I can get you, I, you know, I threw us a couple of hits, but I'm not, I wasn't Herbie Lovebug. Well, on that album, there's a song called No More Questions. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Where you dissed Luke and Vanilla Ice. That's right. I did. We did. <laughs> Someone, it's funny because as we were going through our meeting and I'm announcing who we're interviewing this week, I mentioned this and, and one of my employees, Evan, was like, you know that he dissed Luke and Vanilla Ice on this song, right? I had totally missed that. Right. Uh, when you want to know. Was this your only, your only diss record ever? Yes, it was first and last because first and last. yeah, first Grand and last. Opening, because, once, yeah, once again, like yeah, we we like I said, we you guys weren't like the aggressive like tough guy. No, no. record. Well, this know, is what happened. Rappers. I'll tell you what happened. Um, two different things. Like the the Vanilla Ice thing was, um, he dissed us first. Really? Yeah. He. I mean, in our minds, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> we felt. And you know we're 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 so cool with Vanilla Ice right now. We toured with him like the last four or five so years. On he that. never mentioned your I name. I love though. the nineties. He never mentioned you, your name. Oh no, he's okay. He's, so there was a you felt it was a subliminal disc. No, no, it wasn't sub subliminal disc. No, he had a record. I forgot. I forgot on his first album on on his monster album to the extreme to the extreme right. And he had a record on there and uh, on the on the you know on one of the rhymes he was like something something something. What do you say? And I dance better than any kid or play. He's like, what? <laughs> you hear what this motherfucker just said? You know what I'm saying? Like that was a that was a that was a that's a big I considered that a diss, right? So we filed that away. Now, um the thing with Luke came about because um one time um we were on a, a BET program, I think it was Teen Summit back in the days. So we were on there with Salt and Pepper. And we were like, we were they were interviewing them. You know, Salt and Pepper were the focus. We were just kind of in the back, we're like goofing off and you know acting stupid and shit. And um, Luke and uh, Luke Skywalker and Two Life Crew uh, style of music comes up, and the girls, you know, they flat out come and say, "Yo, we don't, you know, we don't fuck with that. That's you know, it's degrading." And you know, as as they should, you know. Salt and Pepper said that. Yeah, it's Salt and Pepper. Okay. And we're in the back, like we we not even chiming in. We're just in the back, like ah, nah, nah, nah. we, you know what I'm saying? But I think Luke took it like. We felt the same way, and we were we were down with the with the repudiation or whatever like that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they had a record coming out called uh, "I Ain't Bullshit," like part I one or two or something. Yeah, I ain't, I ain't one or two. Yeah. yeah, I ain't bullshitting, right? So um, and in there, they they he they, he threw something at us, like you know one of his rappers, you know one of them cats, uh, threw something at us, and I was like, oh, dip, okay, bet, bet, bet. So when I was writing um, um, Next Question, I addressed that. I addressed um, Vanilla Ice, and then I addressed, um, we addressed Luke. You know, you know, you know, you know, a little, a little bit of wordplay there. Um, but then the problem was, after we came out with that, and matter of fact, Pete Rock produced that record, by the way. Next Question. And, um, but the next record that Luke came out with after that was called Pussy ass kid and ho ass play. <laughs> Let that sink in. Pussy ass kid and ho ass play. After that, I was like, we gotta quit. This. We need to squash this because <laughs> I ain't got nothing for that. <laughs> no response. To I ain't that got one. nothing for that. I ain't got nothing for that. I mean, what, you know what I'm saying? We barely cursed. You know, we darn, darn Luke. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the best we could do. But what ended up happening is we ended up squashing it, man. We had a lot of like, especially with Luke, we had a lot of similar. Uh, you know, we had a lot of mutual friends, and they were just, you know, they kind of just squashed everything. Now, you know, I see Luke now. It's, 
it's all love. And uh, and like I said, you know, Ice has been he he's been really really we've been really really cool the last four or five years. Right, because remember when Luke was beefing with Death Row, that ended in a bunch of stabbings and all types of other oh my God. <laughs> violence and, and so forth. So thank God. Right, exactly. We gotta squash that. <laughs> Yeah, you you gonna stab kid and play? Kid and play does not want to go that direction. You gonna stab kid and play? Who you stabbing next week? The Easter Bunny? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but 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 it was it was a and but it was a different climate back then. I mean, even though it was the stabbies back then, but I mean, you see what these guys, the cats, doing today. This is oh yeah, this shit is crazy out here, man. So then, after <laughs> that album, the movie Class Act comes out, right? Which was basically a house party type movie, but mm -hmm. with a different. A whole new storyline. Yeah, and it was dope. You know, it dope was, movie. I, I went to the theaters to go see it. Yeah. Well, you know what? The thing about Class Act that was so um, interesting and was funny was that story really kind of mirrored um, playing I, and I's life growing yeah. up. Like he was the thug, I was the nerd, and you know that's that's really you know when we read that script, I was just like, how the how the fuck did you get it down so accurately? And um. So yeah, and that we had a we had a great time um, doing that. That was uh, another first time director, uh, Randall Miller, and um, yeah, we we had fun doing that. And that's probably by then. And that movie was with was with Warner Brothers. So mm -hmm. that was probably movie wise. That was probably like our biggest biggest payday. You know what I mean? Yeah, we we hit him up for that one. Well, then House Party Three comes out. Yeah. Bernie Mac is the in it. The public demanded it. <laughs> well, Bernie Mac was in it. Rest in peace. Bernie Mac was in it. Oh, he was natural. Was he was. Yeah. We knew. We knew Bernie was a natural to, um, you know, not replace but to succeed, uh, Robin Harris. You know, so he was easy to cast as, as his uh, younger brother. Um, he's you know from Chicago like Robin, comic just like Robin, dark just like Robin, same vibe. Yeah, no, I remember when I interviewed Faze on Love, right? <laughs> he was super close to Robin Harris. Very. Right. Super close. In fact, he was the one that did the voice for Baby's Kids. Absolutely. Yeah. He, he Reggie Hud and Reggie Hudlin directed there you that go. as well. Yeah. Faze on is my man. Yeah, that's my man too. And in, in the interview, he was saying how later on he went to go work with Bernie Mac. Mm-hmm. And initially, he didn't like Bernie Mac because he felt like he was somehow impersonating Robin Harris in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. Not, it wasn't purposely, but he just felt like it was too close. Yeah. And he was saying how at one point, like it got to the point where they either had to get along or the whole project was about to fall, fall apart. And he said how Bernie Mac got together and said, "Look, man, you ain't you ain't got to respect me, but you're not going to disrespect me." Matter of fact, um, when I met Bernie. For the first time, we didn't hit it off because I thought he was doing Robin. I didn't know he was doing Bernie. <laughs> yeah, they have a similar kind of style. And I was like, Pfft. and we we had a um, a standoff, and it was so funny because one night we had to do we had to do a. We had to share headliners, me, Jamie, Fox, who was cold as a motherfucker back in the day. Follow Jamie Fox, oh my God. So follow Jamie Fox and Bernie. Um, in Atlanta, at the original Comiac Theater, um, I was like, this nigga doing Robin Harris, man, what the fuck? And then I, I was, then he caught me laughing, and then we, 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 we it, was, it, was, it was a fucked up vibe. I remember that. And then um, we broke from there. And um, he did the Def Jam, and then it came to a point where we had to talk because we had to do a TV show. He, had to, he did a television show called um, Pearl's Place. Me... Uh, Angela Means, um, what's my baby name? Um, Adele Gibbons. We all did a TV show, and before we did a TV show, the producers wanted me and Bernie to be brothers in the show. And Bernie's like, "Well, we we gotta sit down and talk because we got some shit to talk about." So he put me and him in the room, and we hashed it out, 
and and it was really some some comedian bullshit. And he told me something I, I always remember. He said, "You ain't got to respect me. Just don't disrespect me." <laughs> I said, "You motherfucker." And he said after that they just became cool and then it was just all smooth sailing after that. Oh yeah. No, I mean just I mean working with Bernie was very similar to working with uh with Robin. You know, I mean I had a lot of scenes with with you know Bernie as well, you know what I'm saying? So we got to spend, you know, a lot of time with one another. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, they were very similar and and you know to to your point and to I think to Faison's thinking, I think he realized like um he it wasn't he wasn't maliciously trying to copy Robin, you know what I'm saying? Like, look, after Tupac died, you know, a lot of a lot of people fell in, a lot of rappers fell into that space mm -hmm. because that because that space was empty, you know, because because you, when you lose a giant, you know, a lot of times, you know, you know, cats need to come in and, and you know, if he's really great, you need more than more than a few to fill that void, like a Tupac, you know, like eighty nine motherfucker, you know. You know X and Ja Rule and everybody coming out trying to fill that vibe, um, um, and and but Bernie kind of did it, and I and I thought he did it in a in a uh, you know a respectful way. He did it his way, like he reminded you of, of Robin, but he was you he know was he, you know he had you yeah. know he had his own little little tilt to it. Um, but just another great guy, you know, tells you know great stories. You know, Robin used to tell great stories. Man, one time Robin told me this story. He said. Um, Cause you know we're sitting around, you know what I mean. You're sitting around all day, you, you know, hurry up and wait. And so Robin tells me these stories, and he told me a story one time. He says, "Man, I, I was dating this girl. I was young and man, I was dating this girl, and she wanted me to come over to dinner and meet her parents. You know, and I'm nervous, you know. So he says, he goes over there, and they have dinner. The mother and father, the girl, he's there, and they have dinner, and everything's going well. You know, everything's cool." And uh, they finish dinner, and um, then here comes dessert. And um, they bring out some pie. The mother had cooked a pie. So they have some pie, and then eat the pie, and then they, they get down to one last slice of pie. There's just one <laughs> slice of pie left. And the father's like, Robin, man, go on, go on. Have that last slice of pie. Robin, go on. And Robin, Robin said, no, 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 sir. I'm, I'm fine, man. I'm, I'm full. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Man, Robin, go on and get that slice of pie, man. Mama done made that pie, man. Go, man, go get you. you know, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. It was delicious. Thank you so much, but I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. He said, man, will you, go, will you go on and eat that slice of pie? Mama done made that pie. Go eat that pie. And finally, Robin said, he's like, all right. Thank you, sir. I, you know, I will. I'll, I'll eat that pie. Thank you. And, you know, finish the pie. So afterwards, um, you know, they're cleaning up. And the mother and father in the kitchen, you know, washing dishes, just kind of cleaning up. And Robin says he had to go to the bathroom. But to go to the bathroom, you got to walk past the kitchen. So he said he walking past the kitchen, and he hear the father say to the mother, can you believe that nigga ate the last slice of pie? <laughs> can you believe it? Motherfucker ate the last slice of pie. <laughs> This was this type of, uh, this type of stories you can tell me. Rest in yeah, peace. Yeah, and I don't know if yeah, I don't know if it's true or not, but I, know, <laughs> but rest I in believe peace, it. Robin Harrison, Bernie. <laughs> yeah. One thing I just realized as I was going through my research before this interview, House Party Three has oh god, Chris Tucker, All Star, Angela Means, Stop it, and AJ Johnson, all three of which ended up being in Friday. <laughs> it's as if Ice Cube went and just. Took your whole cast and just made a new movie out of it. I know what you did, Ice Cube. No. <laughs> well, you know what? You're right. They used a lot of you know, a lot of the similar three people. three yeah. of the characters. Yeah. Well, and, and I don't blame them. First of all, I wish I wish we could have had Chris in our movie more. Yeah. You know what actually happened with Chris was um, uh, he played like a you know he was like managing a stripper a character named Johnny Booze in in our in our movie in House Party Three. And I remember the night before we were going to shoot that, the director, Eric Meza, called me. And he said, yo, man, we still ain't got nobody. You know, me and him was real tight working on the film. And he's like, yo, man, we still ain't got nobody for Johnny Booz, man. You know, what the fuck, what the fuck we going to do? And I was at the comedy store that night hanging out. This was before I, I you know, uh, started doing stand-up. I would I mean, hang out with the comedians all the time. We were all, we were all buddies. And, um, and I knew Chris. You know, Chris had come to uh, come there from from Atlanta, and he'd been out there for a few months. I would see him around and everything, 
And I saw him that night. And I was like, yo, I said, this dude, I knew the, I knew the role was. I said, yo, he could do that. He got, you know, he was so quirky and really different. So uh, when he got off uh, stage that night at the at the comedy store, I just I went up to him. I was like, yo, what's up? And you know, and Chris is so funny. He said, hey, what's up, kid? What your rich ass doing? <laughs> <laughs> that type of thing. You know what I mean? You just see, you, you know, when Chris first came out, we was up in the Roxbury popping bottles and all kind of mm-hmm. shit like that. You know, he would join us, you know what I mean? And and I, I you know, I just thought he was really funny and unique. And so um, you know, I was like, I was like, yo, I was like, um, yo, we got a we got a role, you know, in, in the, the latest house party. You know, come, you know, da 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 da. He said, yeah. You serious, man? Don't lie to me, kid. <laughs> and so I hooked it up and he went down the next day and shot his his scene. And he was he was awesome. He was great. Like just one little scene, and he you know he just popped. And um and and don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, Chris was out here doing his thing. He was gonna pop regardless. I mean, he was gonna come across Ice Cube's you know desk at some point. Yeah, but, he was doing but, Def Comedy Jam. And yeah, everything. and yeah. remember, it's all New Line. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Friday's New Line, House Party's New Line. Mm-hmm. So that that's an easy you know that's an easy thing. And then you know Ice Cube obviously you know. You know, picks who he wants to pick, and he he picks some he picks some great people, man. Yeah, I mean, he had he had Spoon in there too. Shit. Yeah, right. Yeah, there you go, John Witherspoon. Yeah, exactly. And Bernie Mac. And Bernie Mac. Yeah, exactly. Matter Stop of, yeah, it. Hold on, hold on. Four four people. Cube. from House Party Three. Cube. I forgot about Bernie Mac. Cube. four people <laughs> from House Party Three ended up in Friday. That's we gonna need a check, 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 check. <laughs> Yeah, but that's to me. That's to me. That's awesome because. Yeah. Um, and I'll never forget when I remember years later, um, I was in uh, we were in New York and I was doing something. We were doing something at the Waldorf. I was hosting some event, and um, I ran into Chris Tucker and his father. They were he was staying at the hotel, and um, we ran into him. He was like, "Hey, man, what's up, yo?" And he had his dad with him, and he introduced me to his father. He said, "Hey, man, this kid, man, kid, put me in my first movie, man." Dun, 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 dun. You know what I mean? And and I, you know, when I, anytime I run into Chris, um, you know, it's always love. And to me, that's that's that was one of the great things about those house party movies. For a lot of people, it was their first time to mm-hmm. pop off and do their thing. I mean, look, um, we knew, we knew, Martin was going to be a hit. We knew it. All right, from House Party One to House Party Two, House Party Two they didn't want to put him in, in House Party Two at first. They didn't want they didn't want, they didn't have Martin in and they didn't have Full Force in. But we had leverage at that time. I sent the shit back. We sent it back. Say so, we don't need no new villains and we don't need no new best friend. Put them back in and we had the leverage at the time to do that. You know you know how it goes. When they got the leverage, we just got you just got to <laughs> duck your head and you know you know what I'm saying and just and just take it. But at times like that, when we knew, we were just like, nah, man, he's this kid is gonna be fucking huge, man. And 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 when you see that happen, when you see people fly off and pop off and do their thing, I mean, that that thing is a blessing, man. You know, Queen Latifah, Queen yeah. Latifah is awesome. Like, you know what I'm saying? She's a boss, right? Because uh, TLC was at House Party Three as well as uh, Sex as a Weapon. Sex as a Weapon. They were they were they were amazing. They were they were great. You know the scenes they had. They was just they, obviously their chemistry was great. But you know there's a there's a really funny scene where Play and I are trying to convince them to sign with us, our little management company, <laughs> and they're just riffing and they and you know and Play and I are you know it's just really really good stuff that um, thankfully uh, you know and I'm 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 my own worst critic. You know we're our own worst critics. But I'd be damned if them them joints. Hold up to this day, man. There's a reason why, man. You throw on BET, man. They'll throw the three house parties like back to back to back. They ain't doing that if people don't like them. They're not oh, yeah. doing that if if advertisers aren't responding to them. If they can't get the ad revenues that that they're, mm-hmm. they're accustomed to, so that's you know that's crazy. So when I when I look at stuff like that now, I just you know it's you know you, there's a lot of fond memories and a lot of laughs. Right, because then l- way later in 2001, House Party Four came out. Oh. Which had nothing to do with <laughs> anything that you guys had done previously in the movies. We wasn't even in that. We weren't one. even in it. Then they, House- asked, they asked. They, you know what is is weird. What you call it? Originally, they stepped to us, and New Line said, "Yo, we're gonna get Andre Harrell, the the late great Andre Harrell, who I went to college with, by the way, hmm. um, in New York." 
he was going to produce uh, the next house party, House Party Four. Um, but and it, and it wasn't just all on Andre. It was it was the it was the 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 film company as well, New Line. They were kind of feeling like, you know, like I, you know, kid and play, you know, you know, kind of kind of pushing us to the side. They were trying to style it more for um, uh, immature that group. You know what I'm saying? So once again, you know, we got we kind of got emotional about it, and so we were like, "Yo, fuck you. We're not doing we're not doing House Party Four. Okay, we not we don't want to do it. We feel like you know." Our role was being diminished, you mm-hmm. know, in the in the creative talks, and you know, just the vibe. We just, we just didn't feel like we were being respected, so we passed. Now, they start doing the film, and our manager at the time, we had our manager, the late great Bernie Brostein, who's a great guy, one of those old school managers. Go tell you, shut up, you cocksucker, you know, one of them motherfuckers, right? <laughs> so he calls us up and says, hey. They want you to do. They want you to do a cameo in this house party for. Um, all they need you for is a week, and they'll they'll give you a hundred grand a piece. And I remember at the time thinking like, you know, you know, who can't use a hundred grand, you know, for a week, weeks worth. But then there was something in both in my play in my heads was like, you know what they're gonna do? We're gonna do our, our shit for a week. Then they're gonna chop it up, make make it look like we're all up in the joint. We're not. It's gonna flop. We're gonna take a bath. We're gonna get the blame. Now maybe that was a little bit too much conjecture. You know what I'm saying? In retrospect, I probably should have just took the hundred grand and just like you know, and just bounced. Um, but we passed, and I'm glad we passed. It, it wasn't you know. I mean, I love immature and I love those guys, but. It wasn't up to uh, the standard that we had been doing. Right, because then House Party 5 came out. Right. We did that one. In 2013, <laughs> and you guys had a cameo in that. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, was, that, was a, that was different. We got down with that last House Party because the producer was an old friend of mine, uh, an old friend of ours, Doug McHenry, who had actually produced House Party 2. And, you know, he stepped to us and, you know, asked us very nicely. And, you know, it was a... It was a day's work, you know, for a nice piece of change, <laughs> you know. So that that was different. That was more of a on the personal side of it. And like I said, you know, over the years, you just try to stop making um, emotional decisions and and keep trying to make logical ones. So we were making we were making more logical decisions by then. Well, in 2011, uh, you got arrested for missing court dates oh. for a DUI, uh. and then in 2012. Like the same thing happened again? Uh, no, um, no. I think I think initially uh, I I got arrested. I got arrested for a DUI. Mm-hmm. That was the first one, and then they came back and got me after uh, I missed a, a court date, and that was like, that was so wild. Um, I was at I was at home, and I was actually getting ready to go to an audition. And so, you know, I'm dressed up, I'm getting ready to go, and then I, I hear I hear a, you know, boom, boom. And I look outside the um, I look outside the um the door and there's like there's like three people outside. And usually that's usually like when packages come, like delivery. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, wow, this is, must be one hell of a fucking package. There's like three people that, you know, have to deliver this. So I open the door and they go, you know, it's like two dudes and a and a chick. And they look real like official. And um, the the one guy says, uh, "Are you Christopher Reed?" And when somebody <laughs> asks you like that, you just like, oh. <laughs> like you just like, roll, roll. <laughs> and um, it was them. They came to get me because I had, I had missed a court date uh, involving the um, involving the, the DUI. Mm-hmm. So um, the interesting thing about it was they were like they were like super nice. Um, they didn't they didn't cuff me like right away. Um they took me to the car. I guess they had to cuff me in, in the car. And um they were taking me to uh, the local uh precinct. I think it was on um like Wilcox or something like that. And so, you know, we're driving and I'm in the the one guy is driving here, the the lady cop is over here, and then there's like a younger um uh Latino cop that was sitting right next to me. 
So um, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm looking. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out like I was like, wow, this is this is effed up, man. Like you know what I mean? Like I fucked up. And but then I could feel like the cop next to me. Like you ever feel like well, somebody's like like staring at you? You know what I'm saying? Like checking you out, checking you out. And so you know, I finally look at him. And the cop looks at me and he says, "Hey, so uh, what happened to the hair?" <laughs> I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> I was like, are you serious? <laughs> I was like, so I was like, yeah. so we started chit chatting. You know what I'm saying? Man, they were so nice to me. They brought me to the precinct. They they took me outside so I could use my own cell phone, you know, to call up, you know, somebody to come down mm-hmm. or whatever like that. Um, and um, you know, occasionally the the uh, the cops would come out and they were just like. Like kids, you know, they were just like so disappointed. And I was like, I know, I know, I know. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I used to do your dance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they, at one point, well, like the head guy, the sergeant comes out, and he, and he, they got me, um, they got me, um, got me handcuffed to a bench. You know, like with a bunch mm-hmm. of other motherfuckers and shit. And um, so like the sergeant dude comes out, and he steps to me, and he says, "Hey," he said, "What's up with you and TMZ?" I was like, I don't know. What do you mean, what's up with me and TMZ? He said, they just called here asking if you were here. And apparently there's some kind of law that says if you call up a precinct and you ask specifically if, if they have somebody in custody, they have to tell you yes or no. Like, yo, you know, do you got Vlad from Vlad TV down here? They have to tell you. Mm-hmm. So, so that means, and I'd only been there like 15 minutes. So that means... The, the cat's out the bag. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I'm there, and um, um, my boy comes down and gets me. I'm there, I'm there like all afternoon. They put me in my own cell. They gave me juice box and the paper. You know what I mean? They're like, I'm like I got the paper. I'm like, what the Dodgers doing? Man, what's going on here? You know, treat me super, super nice. So my boy comes and gets me. It's like about, probably about 5 o'clock at this point, 5 p.m. And I've got a show that night. I got a comedy uh stand-up show out uh, Ontario Improv that night. So my homeboy comes to get me, and he actually knows, he was my manager at the time, he actually knew uh, one of the detectives that work at the precinct. So he said, yo, man, my boy, is he's going to walk us out, blah, blah, blah. I said, all right, fine. And at first, my my friend wanted to use, like, the secret, yo, let's get the secret entrance so we ain't got to, you know, because TMZ and them is outside. And I was like, nah. I was like, you know what? I said, let's not hide. I said, I'm sure they've been banging me all freaking day. You know, I've been there from like 11 o'clock to like 5 o'clock, so I'm sure they've been killing me. I said, let's at least get the last word as we leave. So we're leaving, we're getting ready to get in my man's uh, Escalade, and sure enough, they outside, they got a, they got a still guy, they got to go, hey kid, what's going on? What's <laughs> happened? <laughs> like this and that. And so, you know, I was, I was chill, and I was just like, hey, um, and I'm out there, I got my boy here, I got the detective with me, coming out, you know, Whatever, I was going to an audition, so I was I was fresh, you know what I'm saying? So I come out and I was like, you know what, I just wanna um I uh, just wanna thank the um thank the police. They were very, very kind. And uh this was this was an unfortunate clerical error. Uh, that's how this happened. And you I didn't say whose clerical error it was, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh it was obviously mine, but I got the last word, we hopped in the car. The next headlines. Kid victim of clerical error. <laughs> and but the funny part was, like I said, I had a show later that night. So I drive all the way out to Ontario to do the, the show. And, you know, I was like a surprise guest on, on the comedy show. So I said, um, you guys get ready to introduce me. So I went to the DJ. I said, yo, when they announced me, throw on Akon's locked up. <laughs> Okay. You know, because the shit's, you know, it's been going all day. So they got, oh, Christopher Carey! The crowd's going crazy. Because they've been hearing about it all day. They've been blasting me all day. So I walk on stage, and I still got the 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 thing they give you. Like the plastic <laughs> shit they give you when you when you get locked up. I got the, still got the thing on. You know, like a, like a badge of honor. Like a stupid <laughs> badge of honor. 
So I'm on stage and I don't even, I ain't even stepped to the mic yet. I'm just standing there on stage, the crowd, they're laughing, they're going crazy, they're hooting and hollering and all kind of shit like that. And then finally I just say, I cut the cousin loose. And then I slowly walk up to the microphone and I said, and how the fuck was your day? <laughs> and boom, they went crazy again. We had a great show. And, but you know, that was just a real, that was a, that was just, that was just dumb. That was just being, but you know, I cleaned, I cleaned it up after that. I had to pay some fines and mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And, well, in 2017, uh, Jason Whitlock I had a show. I get to this. Oh, oh yeah. God. And Jason Whitlock, who had been bashing Kaepernick for, for a long time, had a guy on his show that was basically impersonating Kaepernick. Looked like a white guy with a big afro and a big beard holding up like, you know, like the fist. And everyone's like, who the hell is this, is this dude impersonating Kaepernick? And we found out it is yours truly. Yeah. Kid from Kid and Play. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, Charlemagne gave you Donkey of the Day. Can you believe that? <laughs> well, actually, I actually I can believe it. I mean, I know Charlemagne is Charlemagne's a friend, and yeah. but, but you know, Charlemagne is, you know, you you kind of know that knowing that you know you could you could be cool with him and and chill with him and end up being a donkey. But you know, I I, I understood why he did, and I, I you know, and I understood how why you know why people got upset. Um, but once again, back to something earlier we were talking about, like. Sometimes it's you know your timing is just so off, and um, I think that's I think that's what that situation was about. Um, for my mind, and I've known Jason Will like a long time. I know him from back in the days of sports writer in Kansas City, and um, um, what what I what we had in mind, or certainly what I had in mind, was um, not making fun of uh, of Colin Kaepernick but almost making fun of the media storm that, that was surrounding it, how, how, how everybody was reacting to it. And I had it in my mind like, well, almost like, like a, a Sultan, uh, excuse, me, uh, excuse me, a Saturday Night Live sketch. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. That's that's the type of stuff that that they would do. That's that's kind of what I had in mind. Yeah, but you're doing it with Jason Whitlock. Exactly, which is <laughs> right. Which yeah. which uh, which, which I know throws he, it all off. Which yeah, which which um, you know, and 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 I I, I get that part of it, and and I I didn't I didn't get that uh, initially, um, and also too I think I underestimated um, how sensitive the topic was and how it could be how we could be perceived. And you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound cliche, but anybody that's ever been around me knows that, you know, I, I, I've always stood where Colin Kaepernick stands. You know, I'm from New York. You know, that's that's the that was one of the birthplaces of, of police brutality. Um, but this was this was a, a, a t horrible look, and and I had to, you know, I had to, you know, I had to get smacked around for a little bit with that. And you know, I understand that. Um, Doing it with uh, with Jason was not gonna you know make it look you know was was gonna make it look better. Well, you had a statement that you made. Yeah, you said, uh, oh, "Let God. me address the elephant in the room." And no, I don't mean Whitlock. Look, I get it. Oh, taking God. a pick with Jason Whitlock is like taking a pick with Samuel L. Jackson and Django. Yeah. Yeah. Most people might be perplexed by this act, and others will get litty on you and call you a coon, sellout, or even worse. These are the pitfalls of a public life, and I accept them. Let me be clear, the skit and photo were not meant to disrespect Colin's message or political stance. Rather, we want to spoof the media's treatment of him and the circus that has been created. And yep. there's some other stuff in there, but I think I that wrote, was the main point. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. And you know what? I, I'll say this. I regret um, I regret even saying that about, about Jason like that. Um, and I know he was he was upset by that. And and um, I, I, you know what I'm saying? The other, the other parts of that, that statement, uh, you know, I certainly stand by. Um, uh, but I don't know, you know, at the time it was like, the shit was so hectic, man. It was like a burning building, man. You know, and everybody was just kind of, you know, save yourself, you know, kind of, kind of thing. So, I mean, and, and, and look, that, that was, that, that characterization was, was way too, um, way too harsh. You know what I mean? Like, and I said, I, I, and, and I, I. I regret that. I don't. I didn't mean to characterize him like that. You know, he has a lot of different viewpoints from myself. You know, we've. It's one of those weird friendships that we'd had over the years, where he knew I was a lefty, 
and I knew, you know, his stance on a lot of a lot of different things. And you know, we thought we could make this work, but it was it was a horrible, yeah. horrible catastrophe. And um, you know, um, you know, but thankfully, um, you know, thankfully, I that had I had to weigh that up against. Of you know, thirty years in the game, and whatever you know, credibility and and um, uh, honor that I had you know created over the years. So you know, and if you're you know this, if if you're in the game long enough, you're gonna bump your head a, oh, ti yeah. a time or two, oh, and yeah. and that was that was definitely a, a head bumper, and um, you know, I, it, it certainly made me think, um, in you know, moving forward, how how. You know, we're in a different world mm -hmm. right now, you know, um, and you have to be, and as a public figure, as an entertainer, and as a comedian, as a comedic actor, um, you know, I'm usually really right on, but uh, that one, that one went left, man. Right, because when Jason Whitlock got fired from Fox Sports, I've never seen so many happy people, so, so many celebrations yeah. around his firing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm friends with Marcellus Wiley. He's a regular on my show. I love Marcel. Yeah, uh, he's not looked at the same way as a Jason Whitlock. That's a testament to um, Marcellus being, you know, his own person and, and, yeah. and his own individual. Mm -hmm. Like the way he carries himself and his opinions and his track record, um, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever Jason his baggage was wasn't for some reason didn't rub off on Marcellus. And now, yeah. and Marcellus has moved on with the show, and, and mm -hmm. you know, it's, and it's doing well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you know, like I said, I'm, I'm I, I, you know, th there's a lot of things about that whole situation that that uh, that I regret. There's there's enough regret to go all around. Um, I'm glad we're past it. I'm glad that um, look, and you know, if you remember, you're talking about 2017. That's when the, that's when the joint was just popping off, man. And I just didn't I just didn't read it right, you know. It happens. Uh, I've it gone happens. through my own lumps. Yeah, but over I'm saying yes. Yeah, but but it yeah, is what it is. But imagine yeah. But imagine if, if if it had been a sketch on Saturday Night Live. You know what I'm saying? Like they might have been able to pull that off. Yeah, without Jason Whitlock. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jesus. That that's what really is that what it always comes. Back? I think it really came down to Jason. I think yeah, that, that was that's, that's the whole that, point. Yeah, that right. That that right. <laughs> right. Like if you had done it with like right Shaq right. on his show, right, it would have just right been perceived different. Right. If I did it with DL. Yeah, there you go. Right, I did it with right, but oh, but going back to that, I will say this: a lot of a lot of um, a lot of fans and 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 great friends, um, you know, showed me a lot of love, uh, allowed me to um, explain my position. Mm -hmm. um, even you know, even you know, Harvey and you know, even Harvey and them at TMZ, uh, Willie D, uh, who I know you know yep. uh, well. Willie D was very, very kind to me and allowed me to um, come on his show oh, okay. and, and talk about it. And um, so, you know, like I said, I think I think um, my history and my longevity uh, helped kind of carry the day. But yeah, that was a yeah, that was a that was a bonehead joint right there. That was well, kid, man, thirty years, legendary right. career. Uh, right. And the thing is, is that you've always just been you. You came out being authentic to yourself. You did not try to do what everyone else in hip hop was doing. You did not try to follow a trend. You were the fun, smart kid who loved to dance, who rapped about things that he knew about, became a movie star without even, you know, <laughs> trying to go down that path, just stumbled into it. And it turned into a whole movie career, three successful house party movies plus you know, class act and everything else like that. Um, and really bringing fun and dancing into hip hop, which you still see to this day. Yeah, I mean, I I like, I mean, I still, you know, follow my hip hop very um, intently. Yeah. You know, I try to stay up on, on you know, a lot of the new artists and everything. And um, it, it I, I see a lot of that. I mean, I see a lot of different things, different musical genres and stuff that have kind of evolved, but I still see, you know, a segment out there that, that like the you know the, the the colors and the dancing and the and the fun and stuff like that. I mean, I'll, I'll occasionally people send me records like either um, you know the songs called House Party or the song called Kid and Play. I tell you, I can tell you a quick story. There was these guys that they sent me. Um, occasionally, you know, young cats will send me um, music and say, Hey man, you know you want to drop a sixteen on this man or you know whatever. Maybe you and Play want to do something. 
So I said, yo, man, you know, send me the joint. Email me, email me the, the track. And so I get the track, and, and, and the song is called Kid and Play. It's these two rappers. I'm, 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 uh, the name escapes me for the, for, for the moment. But, uh, but I remember the song was called Kid and Play. So I'm, I'm, you know, playing the joint. I'm saying, let me listen to this thing and see what's going on. And, you know, it was jamming. You know, they rhyming, boom, 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 going back and forth. And they finally get to the, um, to the hook. And then the hook's going like, every day, I'm coming up and I'm going to make you stay. We don't let you say, we tag team bitches, that's that kid in play. Kid in play, kid in play. We tag team bitches, that's that kid in play. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Not what I expected. I was like, whoa, bro. <laughs> That's what kid and play means to you? <laughs> like, huh? I was like, first of all, you ain't never going to get play on this record. <laughs> that's, a, that's, all, that's off the rip. I said, but that's what kid and play means to you? Like, you, you and your mans have sex with the same girl? That's a kid and play? <laughs> like, come on, yo. You know, I appreciate the the, the the effort. I don't know, but <laughs> I'm gonna have to politely decline. <laughs> well, listen, man. Uh, truly an honor as someone who bought your records, That's who went to your movies at the theaters back when you can go to theaters. Uh, Yo, God. <laughs> you know, Yo, they're starting to let people back in the theaters a little bit. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> I'll sit this in one out. China. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll wait till 2.0. Exactly. <laughs> Outside 2.0 comes out. But yo, like I said, as someone who's personally a fan, and it's always special for me to interview people that I was a fan of before I got into the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, before sure. I have relationships with these people or I've heard them say something about me or we have people in common and I'm hearing things about them that kind of influence the purity of the love of the art. You know, I was listening to you guys in high school, you know, in college, I was going to see the wonder movies. years, the wonder years, man. It was just I was just a pure hip, hip hop fan without any dreams of ever doing this for a living. Mm -hmm. And and th this to me is always the special interviews, like when I interview Chuck D or I interview B Real, oh, gosh. you know, guys, like guys like that to me is always is always special. And uh, man, listen, I wish you all the best. You have a you've had a hell of career, a hell of a career and you continue to do your thing, you're still yeah, doing stand up, you're yeah. still doing projects, you're still doing voiceover. Kin Blaze, what's that? It's my weed company. Ah, there we go. The, the Jamaican tag side. Team, bitches. <laughs> the Jamaican side's coming yeah, out. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> Kin came, Blaze. Came, came full circle, man. Truly an honor to sit down with you, man. Wish you all the best. That's what's up, bro. Peace. Peace.